on January 4, 1987, a devastating collision between two trains occurred in the small town of Chase, Maryland on Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. Residents of the small Baltimore suburb were always accustomed to hearing trains flying by at over 100 miles an hour, but none of them could ever imagine such a tragedy would occur here in their own backyards. The Northeast Corridor, built by the Pennsylvania Railroad and currently owned by Amtrak, is known to be one of the busiest main lines in the world. Amtrak trains fly up and down from city to city at speeds of 125 miles an hour. However, the Amtrak trains also have to share the track with slower freight trains, usually traveling between 40 and 60 miles an hour. Slower commuter trains also share these tracks too. Normally these trains are spaced apart via signals and radios, but it depends on everyone following the operating rules. But on that day, up until 1993, would be the worst train wreck in Amtrak's history. On the morning of January 4, 1987, Amtrak train 94, the Colonial, was traveling north from Washington's Union Station to Boston South Station. The train consists of two relatively new Electromotive Division AEM-7 locomotives numbered 903 and 900, with 903 in the lead. Both were built in 1979, and 900 was the prototype for the AEM-7. The locomotives could easily do 125 miles an hour, and were built to replace the aging former Pennsylvania Railroad GG-1 fleet that have served since 1934. The two locomotives had 11 Amfleet 1s in tow, two of them being snack bar cars. There was also an older Heritage Coach, second to last in the consist, number 7624. A crew of five and 660 passengers were on board the train, mostly families returning home from the holidays or students ready for the second semester in school. 35-year-old Jerome Evans was the engineer that day. The train departs Union Station at 12.30 p.m. Meanwhile, at Conrail's Bayview Yard just east of Baltimore, Conrail ENS-121 was preparing to leave light with just locomotives and no freight cars to a NOLA yard in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The locomotives were three rather new General Electric B36-7 diesels delivered to Conrail in 1983, with 5044 in the lead, 5052 in the middle, and 5045 in the rear. 32-year-old Ricky Lynn Gates was the engineer, and 33-year-old Edward Butch Cromwell was the brakeman. The train leaves Bayview Yard at 1.16 p.m., around the same time Amtrak 94 departed Pennsylvania Station in Baltimore. At this point, Switch 12 at Gunpowder Interlocking was set to normal and Track 2 was all lined up for Amtrak 94 to speed through so the Conrail set would have to hold until the Amtrak train had passed before they could enter the corridor. However, this wouldn't be the case. Conrail ENS-121 was approaching Wayside Signal H16-1 at over 60 miles an hour, which was at approach, meaning ENS-121 was supposed to slow down to 30 miles an hour and prepare to stop at the next signal, which would be a stop signal. However, the train does not slow down. It continues past the signal, still going 60 miles an hour. Going under Ebenezer Road overpass, their Pennsylvania Railroad style cab signals displayed a restricting aspect, warning the crew to slow down to 15 miles an hour and be prepared to stop. But again, they didn't slow down. An alerter whistle should have sounded warning the crew about this but someone had muted it with a piece of adhesive tape. Brakeman Cromwell was also supposed to call out the signals if Gates missed them, but he didn't. 
Finally, the engineer notices the final signal, 1 North, which showed a stop aspect, and Gates set the brakes to emergency stop. But because of their speed, they overshot the signal, and the three engines forced their way through the switch and slipped onto the main line onto track 2. The same track Amtrak 94 was flying down. Jerome Evans rounded a blind corner, traveling at over 125 miles an hour, and spots the Conroe locomotive sitting in his path. He immediately hits the emergency brakes, but it was already too late. Amtrak 94 slams into the rear of Conrail ENS 121 at over 120 miles an hour. The force of the impact causes the rear Conrail locomotive 5045 to explode when the kinetic energy passes clean through the empty cab and into the prime mover, knocking it off its mounting and imploding it like throwing a hammer into a CRT TV screen. The explosion destroys the front cab of AEM-7903 and tosses the remains and the rear cab to the west side of the tracks, instantly killing the engineer, Jerome Evans. It's been said his decapitated head was found several feet from the impact site. The middle engine, 5052, suffered severe cab and nose damage, but the frame was mostly intact. 5044 suffered little damage but rolled several feet down the line from the impact before coming to a stop. The second Amtrak engine, 900, was crushed by the Amfleet cars that zigzagged and piled up on top of it. Experts said the force of the collision was like 300 tons of TNT going off, enough to destroy a city block. 911 calls flooded the emergency dispatch centers at first reporting an explosion, but later reporting the actual train derailment. Most first responders feared the worst, and as it turned out, their fears were justified. Locals living nearby came to help the injured, with many of them aimlessly wandering like zombies begging for help with severe injuries. Inside the mangled cars, luggage had fallen all around the victims, seats were ripped from their frames, crushing people, and even worse, inside the snack bar cars, the microwaves had flown from the snack bars and wedged themselves into the walkways, jamming exits. Suddenly there was a big jolt. Next thing we know, we're just tumbling all over the place, baggage was falling. It was just people flying all over the place, just a mess, total mess. There was people like yelling, you know, like, help me, help me, like that. So I, you know, ran up to the train, I crawled through the window, and that's when I seen Jim Howard and Catherine Howard. He was, because he his, must have hit his face against the seat and his eye was all swelled and everything like that. And she was pretty bad. She couldn't get walk at all or anything like that. So we grabbed her and we handed her out the window. Then we helped him out the window. See, everybody says don't move people to the accident, but then you, you know, that diesel fuel and the fire and everything, you don't know if it's going to blow up or not or anything. So if you don't think about it, you say, you know, let's get the people off the train. Within minutes, rescuers specially trained for on-site medical care raced to the scene and were quickly overwhelmed by the chaos and destruction. Passengers begged to the rescuers for their lives, desperate to escape. But unfortunately for rescuers, most of their tools, such as the jaws of life used in automobile accidents, were simply useless against the mangled train cars. They used ladders, airbags, and ropes 
to help the victims the best they could and transfer equipment left and right. Some rescuers saw people take their last breaths right in front of them. Rescuers worked all afternoon into midnight the next day until the last victims were finally freed. A total of 16 people lost their lives and 170 were injured, including the Conrail brakeman Edward Cromwell who suffered a broken leg. Gates, the engineer, was uninjured. What do you remember seeing as far as uh, the wreckage, the people, the injured, and those coming out of the homes around here to help? Uh, yeah, that was it. There was, there was people pouring out of their houses. Uh, I was looking at the wreckage immediately. It was My thoughts was just assisting passengers and whoever I could. Many of them were, uh, they were walking off the train. They, they seemed dazed or in shock. Uh, there, there were many more injured uh, that were stuck in the trains. They weren't as, as quite as visible because they were still inside. What was going through your mind at that point? I was just overwhelmed with how big and how bad it was and, and the amount of injuries and, and the whole situation. Uh, you know. The NTSB immediately launches an investigation into the cause of the collision and what they found was both shocking and infuriating. Blood and urine tests showed that Gates and Cromwell were both smoking marijuana and it was found that they had been passing a joint back and forth in the cab of 5044. However, both denied it at first. After we left the yard, when we were on Amtrak's main line, heading up to this point, uh, we, I took about three hits off. We were passing it back and forth. Were you a regular smoker of marijuana, something you'd used before? Uh, yes, I had used it before. Uh, I suppose I would call myself a regular user. In terms of uh, missing the warning lights, missing the pre-alerts, do you think marijuana had any effect on you? No. People tend to think marijuana has little to no effect on people. As the foreman at Bayview Yard that day stated, he didn't notice anything off about Gates and Cromwell. However, it can alter one's sense of time and impair the ability to perform tasks that require concentration. Hence why Gates missed several signals warning him not to switch to another set of tracks. Marijuana also produces very little visual signs compared to people who drink alcohol as an example, so it's often hard to tell if somebody abuses marijuana or not. Gates even claimed he had a medium approach signal, which would indicate he'd have to slow down to about 30 miles an hour and cross over a set of tracks, but tests of the signals indicated that couldn't be true. It was also revealed not only were the Conrail crew speeding, but the Amtrak train was too. The speed limit for freight trains at gunpowder interlocking was about 50 miles an hour and passenger trains at 110 miles an hour. A speed restriction that was in effect at the time of the accident limited passenger trains to 105 miles an hour as well. Conrail ENS 121 was going 60 miles an hour before its emergency brake application and Amtrak 94 was going 125 miles an hour. However, even if the Amtrak train was not speeding, going at either 105 or 110 miles an hour, it would have made very little difference and would still have no hope of stopping in time when Jerome spotted the Conrail units. Toxicology tests also came back negative in Jerome's body. It was also discovered that the Conrail crew did not do their pre-departure tests before leaving Bayview Yard and as a result, several errors were found in the lead locomotive 5044. The Pennsylvania Railroad style cab signals had the approach bulb missing and the little whistle that would alert the crew that they had passed a signal other than clear was silenced with adhesive tape. The biggest single, uh, I guess, technical problem would have been the whistle being taped over. The alert whistle taped over. Right. Gates claimed he didn't know where it was, and he also said he didn't mute the whistle himself. That particular day, I was looking to cut corners. I, I didn't know where the whistle was located in that particular engine. However, whether that was true or not, it was his job to not only look for it, but to also remedy it and the other issues. 
To make matters worse, the radio in 5044 was non-functional, so they had to borrow the radio from 5045 and put it in 5044, but the crew stated they had a lot of difficulty hooking it up, so it was mostly non-functional. Interestingly, this same issue was also present in the Amtrak engines, as 903 did not have an operable radio in either end, so the Amtrak crews borrowed one from 900. If that wasn't enough, Gates also apparently had quite the bad driving record, receiving a DUI and other traffic violations sometime before the accident. As a result of the NTSB's findings, Conrail immediately suspended both Gates and Cromwell, but both resigned instead of facing certain termination of employment. Gates was later charged with manslaughter by locomotive, and after pleading guilty, he was sentenced to a hundred years in prison. The high sentence was mainly for lying to federal investigators, but he instead served five years in a Maryland prison. Under Maryland law, a locomotive is considered as a motored vehicle and was one of the first convictions of a locomotive engineer for such a crime in the state of Maryland's history. After he served his time, he worked as a drug and alcoholism counselor for about five years warning people of the dangers of drugs and alcohol to people like high school students. After my guilty plea was entered, I stated my desire to aid those groups interested in making passenger travel safer. That is the reason I am here today. I am not here today to tell this committee what legislation it should recommend, but to relate my experiences in the industry in the hopes that a tragedy of this magnitude will never occur again. As I said on January 16, 1988, I have relived the events of January 4, 1987 over and over again in my mind and the pain never goes away. I cannot begin to imagine the pain and the grief I have caused those touched by the accident. I am sorry. I hope my testimony can aid this committee. I believe that random drug and alcohol testing is the appropriate response to an industry-wide problem. My experience has led me to believe that testing based upon reasonable suspicion standard is not effective. I say this because I believe that standard provides little if any guidance for those actually in the field. Furthermore, the discretion inherent in this standard means there is little uniformity in its application. Presently, according to a form post at CSTrains.com, he now works as an operating engineer running heavy equipment. He still misses the railroad and still loves trains, and it definitely appears he's quite remorseful for his actions. After the accident, federal legislation now requires random drug and alcohol tests on safety-related positions. This includes locomotive engineers. Also, as a direct result of the collision, federal legislation was enacted that required the FRA to develop a system of federal certification for locomotive engineers. These regulations went into effect in January of 1990, and ever since then, Railroads are required by law to certify that engineers are properly trained and qualified and that they have no drug or alcohol impairment motor vehicle convictions for the five-year period prior to certification. The NTSB also recommended Conrail and other railroads to be more vigilant in spotting employees that abuse substances like marijuana and alcohol not to mention be more stricter on pre-departure checks so that errors like a missing bulb for the cab signals can be spotted and rectified as well as taped alerter whistles. An inspection of locomotives in the Baltimore area found six more units with taped whistles. Another recommendation was interestingly to the signals. The Pennsylvania Railroad style signals always had one color for all aspects, amber. This accident would eventually lead Amtrak to replace them with color-coded position signals now found all across the Northeast Corridor, with the only known exception being on the Keystone Corridor between Paoli and Philadelphia, which still retains the Pennsylvania Railroad-style amber signals. 
the accident led to all locomotives operating on the Northeast Corridor to be required to have automatic cab signaling with an automatic train stop feature. Although common on passenger trains up until that point, cab signals combined with a train stop and speed control had never been installed on freight locomotives due to the potential train handling issues at high speed. Conrail subsequently developed a device called a Locomotive Speed Limiter, or LSL, a computerized device that is designed to monitor and control the rate of deceleration for restrictive signals in conjunction with the cab signals. All freight locomotives which operate on the Northeast Corridor must now be equipped with an operating LSL which also limits top speeds to 50 miles an hour. Previously, freight locomotives were only required to just have cab signals, but not an automatic train stop feature. This system also paved the way for automatic braking systems, such as positive train control, a system now installed on several lines, including the Northeast Corridor. As for the locomotives and equipment, 5045 was totally destroyed and was never rebuilt. Both AEM-7s 903 and 900, plus a few of the Amfleet 1s on the front of the consist, were also deemed a total loss and scrapped. 5052 was eventually repaired at Juniata Shops in Altoona, Pennsylvania and returned to service, as was 5044, which had minor damage. When Conrail split and ceased operations in June of 1999, 5052 was sold to CSX renumbered to 5805, still retaining its Conrail livery, until being sold in the early 2000s to Estrada de Ferro Victoria Minas, a railroad in Brazil, where it was re-gauged to 1,000mm gauge tracks and renumbered as BB36-7 number 744. It was last photographed in 2006 and is likely still in service. 5044 was also given to CSX, renumbered as 5801, also keeping its Conrail livery, until being sold to Estrada de Ferro Victoria Minas, regaged and renumbered to 740. It would be sold again to Valor da Logistica Integrada, being repainted, but still keeping its old number 740. It is still in service as of late 2021. Ten years after the accident, the McDonough School of Owings Mills, Maryland decided to build a 448-seat theater in memory of one of the crash victims, 16-year-old Cerise Millicent Horn, who was on board at the time. She was the daughter of American mathematicians Roger and Susan Horn. She graduated from McDonough at age 15 and was on her way to Princeton University where she would study in astrophysics until the accident. On January 4, 2007, 20 years after the crash, her family visited the theater for the very first time and attended a ceremony at the McDonough School held in honor of their daughter. The Baltimore County Fire Department's medical commander at the scene 20 years earlier told the newspaper that the Amtrak crash is still being used as a case study in effective disaster response. He said on quote, the reason is how the members of the professional and volunteer fire departments and the community people got together. It was, he said, a very sad but very proud moment in his career. The accident would remain the deadliest and the worst in Amtrak's history until 1993 when its death toll was surpassed by the Big Bayou incident when Amtrak Sunset Limited hit a damaged bridge at 70 miles an hour and plunged into the Mobile River in Alabama. That wreck killed 47 and injured 103. One of the worst rail disasters in American history, Chase, Maryland will certainly never be forgotten. On the 30th anniversary of the collision, yours truly made a documentary on this accident, and that same video not only led to several more being produced on other accidents, but this remaster as well. It has been 35 years now since this tragedy, and while some mental scars shared with victims, families, and rescuers alike will never fully heal, the fact this accident led to sweeping changes that helped make rail travel safer is something we can all 
be grateful for.